The San Diego Union Tribune is San Diego's largest and most experienced news organization. Winner of four Pulitzer Prizes and 37 regional Emmys. We deliver the news with depth, authority, and over 150 years of local knowledge. Our journalists speak truth to power. The Union Tribune serves everyone who cares about our community. Support our work. Subscribe to down our website, sandiegouniontribune.com. Los habitantes de San Diego logran grandes cosas todos los días. Nos preocupamos por nuestros vecinos y por nuestra comunidad. Nos adaptamos al cambio. Hacemos que nuestros líderes rindan cuentas. Vivimos en una de las ciudades más dinámicas de América, el San Diego Union Tribune y el Union Tribune en español. Hemos contado la historia de San Diego por más de 150 años. We use our phones to order food, share our stories, and so much more. SDCCU made banking from your mobile device easy too. You can do so much. Get up-to-date account balances, deposit checks, and more safely and securely, all through the convenience of your smartphone. Get all of this and more with free checking with e-statements. SDCCU, it's not big bank banking, it's better. Hello, I'm Dr. Noelle Norton, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of San Diego. And I'm Brian Clack, a Vassiliadis Director of USD's Humanities Center. USD, along with the College of Arts and Sciences and the Humanities Center, is proud to be the presenting sponsor for the 2022 San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books on the USD campus. Our partnership with the Festival of Books enables all of us avid readers to come together as a community alongside renowned authors from all over the world and to dive deeply into imaginative stories and important themes. As a university deeply committed to the liberal arts, USD promotes a form of lifelong learning that ignites curiosity, builds critical connections across different ideas and topics by seeing them from different perspectives. On behalf of the University of San Diego, we thank you for joining us for today's program to explore the world of books with us. Enjoy the festival. Welcome to the San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books. I'm the moderator for this panel. Uh, my name is Jonathan Hunt. I'm the coordinator of library media services at the San Diego County Office of Education, which basically means that I support the 42 local school districts in terms of library services. I also review children's and young adult literature for the Hornbook magazine. I occasionally write for School Library Journal, and I've had the great good fortune of serving on quite a number of prestigious award committees. So needless to say, um, children's and young adult literature is something that I'm really passionate about. So to that end, I'm absolutely delightly delighted that they have invited a fabulous author for me to join in conversation with. Her name is J.C. Cervantes. She is a New York Times bestselling author of books for children and young adults. Her books have appeared on national bestseller lists, and she has earned multiple awards and recognitions for her writing. JC currently resides in the Land of Enchantment, which is New Mexico, with her family, three spoiled dogs, and a lifetime collection of books. When she isn't writing, she is haunting bookstores and searching for magic in all corners of the world. Flirting with Fate is a swoony, heartwarming young adult debut. It weaves an unforgettable tale about family, fate, and finding love where you least expect it. Now, um, when I was a teacher in the classroom, one of the things I loved to do was collect first lines of novels, and I could use it as either a writing prompt, like when I wanted to show uh, a writing prompt or teach kids about how to hook an audience, so you know, or to simply do it, use it in a book talk. And so, um, I absolutely love the first line, the first sentence of this novel, which opens thus: On July seventh, at precisely 9:01 p.m., a boundless, unpredictable storm claimed one life, two hearts, and six destinies. I just absolutely love that. So um, 
without any further ado, why don't you tell us a little bit about this book, JC, and how it came to be? It's kind of an interesting origin story. First, I would like to say thank you for having me. Um, I was born and raised in San Diego, and so I still call it home. And, and I come often, and I was disappointed that I wasn't able to make the trek this time. But thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled. Um, so this particular book came to me at a time I was, it was right at the beginning of COVID. And I'll tell you a little bit about its inception, because I think that leads into what the book is about. And so it was right when we were starting to really take COVID seriously and we were all thinking, oh gosh, this is, you know, this is very problematic for everyone. And like I always do, I sat down with my agent and I said, you know, here are some ideas I'm, I'm working on, you know, which ones do you like? And we kind of strategized together. So I was actually scheduled to move to a darker middle grade um, and then everything happened with COVID and I needed light and I needed levity and I needed joy. And so in many ways, I wrote this book for me. Um, I'm of Mexican descent. I come from a very uh, matriarchal family. And so I definitely see my aunts and my cousins and my mom and my sister in the characters of this book. But the book is essentially about Ava Granados. She is um, coming into her senior year and she comes from a mystical family in that all the women in the family have this ability, this magical ability to pass on a blessing to descendants. But the catch is they can only do so from their deathbed. And so the book opens with her grandmother passing the blessing to her sisters, excuse me. <clears throat> and Ava is desperately trying to get home. They live in Santa Monica, California. She's trying to get home through a rainstorm and she misses the passing of the blessing. And or so she thinks. And so different elements kind of unfold and we realize that maybe that blessing went somewhere else on the wind of fate. And that's what she has to then go and find that blessing, get the blessing back so that her grandmother is not left in this kind of purgatory state as a ghost. And so one of the things that I think I love most about the book is I really wanted to take a long view of fate you know, what did it mean when our grandparents made this decision, you know, in 1952 to do this? How did that affect, you know, future generations and the, you know, the destinies that unfolded for us? And then how do we have that ability when we make decisions um, that are going to affect other generations? And so I really wanted to play with that. And we see that definitely unravel throughout the course of the book. But mostly it's a book about love and family and commitment and loyalty and Mexican magic and fate. Excellent. And I see that you have copies of the book in the background. And <laughs> one thing that people might not be able to see from this distance is the absolutely beautiful cover. And I know a lot of times the authors don't have the ability to pick their covers, but are you in love as in love with the cover as I am? It's just beautiful. I love it. I love how it captures the nature of California. You know, when we think of California, we often think of bustling cities and smog. And I love that this captures that and the starry sky. And, and there's a simplicity to it, right? So yeah, I, and then they, they continued that through the back of the jacket. So I love it. Absolutely. And, you know, while we're speaking about covers, I know that you have a wildly successful line of middle grade fantasy novels that have um, been published with Rick, um, Rick Reardon Presents imprint. And those also have beautiful covers. Uh, and I even love the cover for Tortilla Sun. So I just think you've been very blessed in terms of the I covers. Have. Very. You're right. Yes, they're all amazing covers. And you hear all these horror stories about authors that, you know, have a book saddled with a cover that's not attractive or appealing. Right. And yours have been completely the antithesis of that. Um, so you've been spoiled, I think. But um, I guess I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. What I really wanted to ask is obviously you've written for middle grade quite a few novels, and this is your first your first young adult. Mm -hmm. And you, you've written fantasy, so it's familiar, but it's not quite as epic in scope as maybe, you know, those, those earlier novels that you wrote. So it's more of like magical realism. So I guess I'm asking you to do like a compare and contrast. How was writing for different audiences and different niches within the fantasy genre. How is that the same and how is it different? 
if it was different at all? Yeah, I definitely think that was, those are some differences, you know, and, and I think it's a really great question. And at the end of the day, you know, it's about being a storyteller and it's about the story that needs to come out and the story that demands to be told. And I know when I have a story that demands to be told, and those are the those are the books that I focus on because I have lots and lots of ideas, but it's it's when it comes to you in such a way that it won't leave you alone. So I want to say that first and foremost. Um, secondly, you know, fantasy in the Stormrunner series is a lot of fun to write. You know, it's based on Maya mythology, and in that particular series, I had to really honor and follow with authenticity much of the mythology. I mean, I definitely took some artistic license and I played with it a bit too, but there are elements to fantasy that you can kind of utilize magic in a way that can get your characters out of sticky situations. And I love writing big epic fantasy. I think it's a lot of fun and it really drives my imagination in completely different ways. And then when you talk about coming to a contemporary novel like um, Tortilla Sun, my first book, or this, Flirting with Fate, I really wanted to focus on the elements of the mysticism, not necessarily the high fantasy kind of magic because there isn't. But what is this mysticism? What is this power that these women have? Why does this thread run through the family? And so that's what that's what I focused on. But I, I got to tell you, I, I actually think that writing contemporary is a little bit harder for me anyway, it's a little bit more challenging because it forces me to really stick my nose to the grindstone and make decisions that are organic to the story that aren't, you know, just out of the blue and that play within the rules of that world. And I think anytime I can play in a world that has these big, big, big magical rules, I think that there's a little bit more, um, there's a little more play, I think, in that area. Excellent. Um, you know, I was thinking as as I as I was preparing preparing for this. You know, I looked at revisited the book. I looked at the publisher blurb, and they've really drawn comparisons to Jane the Virgin, Jane the Virgin. I'm sorry, Jane the Virgin, which is I, I believe a TV series. I am not familiar with that. Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I'm very familiar with. But the thing is that for me, both of those are kind of older examples, and so I thought of some more recent comparisons that also I felt really spoke more to the fact that this there's a really strong heritage aspect to this, right? This is definitely a Latino themed novel. Mm -hmm. And so what what it reminded me of was Encanto. Like I would think of Encanto more as a middle grade and this was kind of like a YA version of this, which yeah. is interesting because I'm sure that you were writing this novel in process when that movie came out. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying it's inspired by Encanto. It just has the same kind of a feeling. And another YA novel that came out a couple of years ago called Cemetery Boys, you know, some of that magical mysticism and the family dynamic um, right. kind of resonated. I don't know that you know that novel. Some of our audience members might. But I guess in a long-winded way, I'm just asking you to talk. You've alluded to it. Can you talk a little bit more about how you drew on your Mexican heritage um, to create um, the novel. Yeah. So, you know, I grew up in a family where magic um, and mysticism was a part of our everyday lives, whether that was through our spiritual practices or our daily beliefs. And because of that, that's what's informed all of my decisions. And so that is the lens with which I look at the world. And so it's a very natural thing for me um, to do that. And so to bring that into my stories also feels very natural. It doesn't feel far reaching. It doesn't feel foreign. Um, and I, and I think, you know, the Latinx culture is this umbrella term that we use for many, many, many distinctions underneath that. Um, and even within the Mexican culture, you know, I have a really good friend who lives in South Texas and his experiences growing up versus mine. I grew up in Southern California and San Diego, as a matter of fact, um, were vastly different, even from the food, some, from some of the words that were used, from um, you know family traditions. And then here in New Mexico, it's vastly different as well. And so I definitely utilize that in every single book I write, and I will continue to do so because I think it's so beautiful and it's so magical and it's so mysterious. And 
really in many ways, I think I'm writing these stories because I'm trying to figure something out because I'm trying to understand my place in the world because I'm trying to understand my own culture. And, um, and so I've, I've done that, you know, I have another young adult novel that's coming out, um, next spring. Um, I did the same thing entirely different, um, from flirting with fate, but a lot of the same elements. Um, and then my first adult novel is coming out next year as well. And I incorporated the same, and thank you, the same elements. Um, and I think it goes back to what you were asking earlier, Jonathan, you know, writing middle grade versus YA. And now I'm adding adults to that. And it never, I never think about that age category. You know, I always think what's the story that needs to be told. Excellent. And just out of curiosity, the adult novel uh, is a fantasy novel too? It's magical realism. It's called The Enchanted Hacienda. Okay. And it takes place on a magical flower farm in Mexico. And it comes out with Harper Collins. The imprint is Park Row. And I think it comes out next summer. They don't have an exact date yet. Oh, okay. That's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations on Thank that. You. Thank and you. And I was going to say, one of the things I really liked about this was the way that you liberally incorporated, like, Spanish words and phrases. And, and more often than not, those were untranslated, which is something that you know, we didn't used to see very much of that. The editors always insisted that if you drop that word, then you had to translate it immediately thereafter. So I'm wondering if you, is that kind of thing changing? Because like as a teacher and as an adult, I know that I read lots of words that I don't understand, that I don't look up in the dictionary and I just kind of gloss over it and I still get the overall gist of the paragraph that I'm reading. So I'm just wondering in your sense, do you feel like editors are more open to, to, to taking those words untranslated and to just, and to, you know, your inclusion of other cultural aspects that they might not be familiar with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's actually a movement in that direction. And I think that even down to not italicizing Spanish words, you know, not calling them out as other. Um, and I think when you contextualize another language with, you know, English, if, if we're talking about English speak, you know, that that's their, um, their first language, people can pick it up. They know, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not challenging to do so. And I think people really like it and appreciate it. No, no, absolutely. Um, I see, I was just thinking that we, I feel like the Latinx population in the United States is fairly big and it's doing nothing but growing, but I've always felt like the representation in both middle grade and picture books and YA has lagged behind some other ethnic groups that have some very visible authors. But I think in the last year, several years, maybe two, three years, that started to change and we've been seeing a, an outpouring of that. And I think you're a very, very important part of that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to circle back to, uh, again, another thing that you've alluded to previously. And one of the things that I loved about this novel is that very complex dynamic relationship you mentioned a matriarchy and so you definitely that's really for me what's kind of like the beating heart of this novel the complexity you know the sister relationship you know is wonderful the grandmother the memories of the grandmother and the ghost of the grandmother and then the mother's backstory is really intriguing so could you could you dive into that a little bit more for us yeah, I mean, I think part of that is because I did grow up in a family like that. And, you know, I also have three daughters and they were raised in a very matriarchal family. And it's interesting to me because sometimes I wonder if, you know, what it is about the Mexican culture that really elevates women's status in terms of this level of, um, for lack of a better word, magic, right? these spiritual powers, this ability to heal, this ability to, um, you know, interpret, you know, different rules of the world in a way that is more magical. And I think that, I don't know if that comes from the Catholic roots and what we've done with the um, female saints and with Mary, I don't know if that is something that starts in our indigenous roots, um, you know, back thousands of years ago. I'm not sure where that comes from, but that's something that I always explore, that there's so much power in women um, that they're just tapping into that is literally in their blood and that they have more power than they know. 
And mm -hmm. whether you're Mexican or not, right? What, whatever your background you come from, that there's something so distinctly beautiful about the feminine. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I always like to um, go back to that I talk about you you're going to see it in in um, books coming out even the um i have a middle grade novel coming out and it's a spinoff from the storm under the lords of night and it centers around a female character and her powers and she's actually the most powerful of all and what that means you know what do you then do with that power and can you tap into it can you tap into it its authenticity and so for me you know i wish i had a better answer for you that was more concrete but it feels more like an, a mystery that i'm just peeling back layers with every single book that i write no absolutely i i think that makes sense it, you know i'm married to a guatemalan so i <laughs> definitely could relate to a lot of the dynamics in yeah. there to, uh -huh. uh, one step removed from it you know and i definitely observe them so i definitely understand the mystery of it and like you said there is a very it's a very interesting brand of feminism because it often exists side by side with the very machismo culture not always but but sometimes yeah. right yeah. And so it's kind of a, it, I don't know, it's very interesting. And so I, there's there's definitely a lot there to kind of explore and unpack, not yeah. just in this book, but in future books as well. Um, well, I'm sure we've kept our audience waited, um, or a certain segment of our audience is probably waiting for us to get to the romance, right? Because this is, as much as this is a fantasy novel, this is also a romance, right? We've got Ava who, um, who meets Orion, who goes by Ryan for sure. And they, that, you know, that becomes the love interest here. So could you talk a little bit about that romantic aspect? If this might've been a new element for you, can you just talk a little bit about how you developed that um, in this novel? Yeah, it was definitely, you know, I've always wanted to try my hand at romance and I dabbled in it here. It's, it's very light, it's very um, PG. Um, as you know, if you've read the book and, you know, middle grade readers can absolutely read this book. And it's something that I wanted to really look at. And I take it even further in the book that I was talking about that comes out next year. I'm really interested in the dynamics of love. Like, what does that mean biologically? What happens to us physically when we fall in love, when we are attracted to someone else, when we can't think about anything else, when it's this all consuming feeling. And how does that then, how does that experience help us form an identity, right? Because I think when you're falling in love and when you're in love with someone, you see yourself through their eyes and you're kind of falling in love with yourself at the same time, if that makes sense. And so I really wanted to play with those dynamics with Ava and Ryan and like I said, with a really light touch and what that would mean for her identity and the choices that she made. And, and then we see, you know, a very different love story that's happening. And I, I obviously can't give it away, but there's a very beautiful love story that's happening on the backstage as well. That kind of is this common thread that brings everything together in the novel. And I loved it. And again, I loved it so much. I think one of my favorite tropes in romance is childhood love so like you fell in love in the sandbox i call it sandbox love mm -hmm. and so the book that i have coming out next year they've been in love since they were six years old and and what does that mean you know how rare is that and so i think there are so many questions as human beings that we can ask about love and you want to talk about magic and mysticism and power you know if we really open ourselves in a vulnerable way which is not an easy thing to do how does that shape who we are you know how does that shape the decisions we make how does that shape our fate do you feel like you're finished with these characters? Um, do you feel like there could be a sequel? Like you mentioned that other relationship. Um, do, you, do you feel like you're finished with this character or this world? Um, or is this something that you just have to wait and see if the inspiration strikes? Yeah, I, I think I have books coming out through 2025 that I'm contracted with right now. And um, and so, you know, I, I think that's a great way to put it, you know, if inspiration strikes, but right now it's just a standalone. Excellent. And then another question that just came to my mind, I, you know, I was thinking this would be a great like Netflix rom-com, right? Um, I'm wondering if, if, if any of your, um, if any of your books, but particularly this one, have, have any, have there, has there been any interest in the, you know, in the film rights? 
Yes, there's definitely been interest. Um, I have had a book optioned. This one has not been optioned yet. Um, I, I I think that it would be a delightful rom-com. It's interesting because when I was writing it, I saw it as a movie in my head. Um, and I mean, everything from, you know, the fun, the fun glitzy part of LA, because mm -hmm. um, we know LA has many personalities. And, and this particular family, you know, I really wanted to show this family, we have a very specific mindset in this country of what it means to be Mexican and depending on what, where you're at in this country. Um, and I'm certainly not generalizing to the entire population, but we have these preconceived notions. And I really wanted to drive home that Mexicans can be educated, they can be wealthy, they can be very successful business owners. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, that was that was something that I, I try to do. I try to show a very different side of the Mexican culture that I not only have experienced either firsthand or secondhand through friends or, you know, growing up or whatever it is. Excellent. Um, I also thought, I mean, I also feel like while this is probably primarily identified as a fantasy romance, I also felt like there was a an element of mystery, right, in terms of what the mother's backstory is. And you do that with a plotting, you know, with uh, flashbacks, you do that with some of the clues that the grandmother drops. But I definitely feel like it's kind of like, if you are a fan of genre fiction, there's going to be something for everybody in this book, whether it's the fantasy or the mystery or the romance. And probably many readers will be hooked on all three of those elements. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. You know, the mother, um, that was a very organic part of the story. You know, I, Ava, my characters always come to me fully formed. I don't do character worksheets or anything like that. I'm really lucky in that regard. And, you know, I knew that this was a young woman who had, did not have the influence, a positive influence of a mother. And, and what did that mean? But she had a very positive influence in her grandmother and in her father and obviously with her sisters. And so I didn't think that it would be fair for her mom not to have any page time. And yet I didn't want her to be on the page in live scenes, if that makes sense. And so we get the mom in these kind of flashbacks in this fairy tale that she had told Ava. So not only are we seeing who her mom was and what her mom thought about love and how that has shaped Ava, but we're also seeing, you know, this idea of, what Ava has learned, because, you know, when, when we pass on beliefs and traditions to children, we believe them until a certain age. And, you know, hopefully we do our own work and we figure out, you know, what is my worldview going to be? But I definitely think that her mother shaped her in very powerful ways that that really needed to be on the page. Excellent. And um, we're 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 running we're running out of time fast, and I have a lot of questions. But I'll just I'll just pick a couple of them. But um, one of them that I wanted to ask is about the setting of the book because it see it feels so authentically Los Angeles with you know different locations and neighborhoods and everything that I had wondered whether you're a native of Los Angeles and you've you've admitted San Diego. So I'm just wondering if you visited Los Angeles a lot over the years or if this is research or some kind of combination of, of the two, because I almost feel like Los Angeles itself kind of really contributes to this atmosphere of mysticism and magic and mystery. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I love about Los Angeles is that it's a place people go to um, kind of reinvent themselves or invent themselves with this whole Hollywood mystique, right? And so I thought that was a perfect backdrop. But to answer your question, you know, I've spent lots and lots of time in L.A. You know, when I was um, growing up in San Diego, I would spend as much time in L.A. I don't know why I've always loved it. Um, people argue with me and tell me that New York is the best city. And I keep trying to sorry for the New Yorkers out there, but I think Los Angeles is. Um, and I argue with my husband because he says it's San Francisco. But I think L.A. just has so much personality. And um, I did go there quite often um, over the course of you know, writing this book. And I walk, I've, I've spent lots of time in Santa Monica. It's, it's one of my favorite places to go and wind. Excellent. Um, my last question was going to be about upcoming projects, but I think you've answered most of those, right? You've talked about film options. You've got the adult novel coming out. You've got your next YA coming out. So I don't know that there are any beans left to spill <laughs> um, in that regard. A lot of people don't like talking about future projects unless they're into the, quite into the, you know, into the 
you know, into that process. So I appreciate you being very forthcoming. It gives us something to, to definitely look forward. So I want to thank you so much for, for joining us and being a wonderful conversational partner. We learned a lot about this amazing book. I hope that people will check it out. In fact, I hope people go purchase the book from our indie book sale partners at bookshop.org backslash shop backslash S-D-F-O-B. Um, please also consider um, supporting our nonprofit partner, the San Diego Council on Literacy, by donating at literacysandiego.org. And finally, continue joining us for more on-demand and live-streamed author panels. All videos will be available on stfestivalofbooks.com. Thank you again, um, audience, for joining us. Again, I'm Jonathan Hunt, and thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jose Cruz, CEO for the San Diego Council on Literacy, a proud partner with the San Diego Union Tribune in the 2022 presentation of the Festival of Books taking place this Saturday at USD. Today, we're at the festival site, and in just a few days, this campus will be buzzing with people who love books, love reading, and love writing. The Festival of Books is our community's largest single gathering place for writers, publishers, and book lovers of all ages. The San Diego Council on Literacy is the beneficiary of proceeds from this event. When you participate in the festival, you support greater literacy in our region. This means a lot of things, including more books for children who need them the most. And of course, by being here, you'll have a good time. So please join us Saturday, August 20th, as we converge with thousands of other festival attendees to celebrate the joy of reading here on the USD campus.